Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be doing another Kahoot, and I'm going to be covering physiological integrity. Remember what I taught you about physiological integrity, anything that can put your patient's life or health at risk, vital signs, hemodynamic status, fluid and electrolytes, uh, nutrition, glucose, airway breathing circulation, signs and symptoms of um, myocardial infarction, stroke, all that good stuff. Anything that actually um, is a threat to a patient's physiological integrity, that's a threat to their life. So this is going to be part one of a multi-part series. Before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you, please support me and support this channel. How can you do that? Like this video. You're going to love it. Press that like button now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already and press that red notification bell so you'll be notified every single time a new video is released. Don't forget, I'm now offering next generation NCLEX reviews as well as one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions. And all, as always, you can always uh, get some audio lessons. All of this can be found on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Now, without any further ado, let's get started. Physiological integrity, part one. Which of the following would you expect to note on assessment of your patient that's exhibiting Cholstec signs? Would it be discoloration of the abdomen and periumbilical area? Would it be carpal spasm elicited by compressing the upper arm and causing ischemia? Would it, be, would it be spasms of the face muscles by tapping the facial nerve? Or would you choose epidermal, uh, the epidermal skin layer can be rubbed off by slight friction? Which one is Cholstec? Which one would you see in the patient with Cholstec sign? Very good. Spasms of the face muscles by tapping the facial nerve. Um, that is Trostex. And you see this. This is a form of tetany, by the way. You see this when the patient has hypocalcemia. The calcium in the blood is low. You know ventricular fibrillation on your patient's cardiac monitor. You rush to your patient's room and you expect to find the patient dizzy and nauseated, complaining of severe complications, hypotensive and pale, or pulse, pulseless and unresponsive. I apologize, I spelled, I spelled pale incorrectly. That's P-A-L-E and I spelled unresponsive incorrectly, but you guys know what I mean. Your, pa your patient's going through AFib. That's what you see on the machine. What do you expect to see when you run into your patient's room? Very good. You expect your patient to be pulseless and unresponsive. That patient's going through VFib. You see no P wave at all, right? What are you going to do? Defibrillate? Okay, Professor D, what if there's no defibrillator? What am I going to do? CPR? You're going to scream at the top of your lungs for help and perform CPR immediately if you are unable to defibrillate. Select all that applies. You're giving a blood transfusion. What signs or symptoms would alert you to a hemolytic re uh, reaction or hemolytic transfusion reaction? Select all that apply. Headache, tachycardia, hypertension, apprehension, feeling of impending doom, anxiety, and fear. Select all that applies. If you guys hear Compa in the background, I'm home. I'm filming. My husband's playing dominoes with his friends downstairs, so I don't know what to tell you. You guys are doing great on the live. All right, all of them. So you're giving a blood transfusion and your patient has a hemolytic transfusion reaction. You expect for that patient to complain of a headache. You expect to see that heart rate go up, the blood pressure go up. They start to be apprehensive. They start to be fearful. They start to be anxious. 
They may not be able to describe what they're feeling, but you can see the apprehension. They have a feeling of doom. They don't know what's wrong, but they feel like they're going to die, right? What is the very first thing that you do once you suspect your patient's having a hemolytic transfusion reaction? Stop the infusion. And that's across the board. Whenever you're doing something for your patient and you suspect that whatever it is that you're doing for your patient is causing harm to your patient, the first thing you do before you assess them, before you call the RN, before you call the doctor, you stop whatever you suspect is harming your patient. Your burn patient is experiencing a decrease in fluid volume. Which intervention would you perform? Would you obtain and record the weight every other day? Are you going to monitor INOs every shift? Are you going to monitor the patient's mental status hourly? Or are you going to monitor the vital signs every four hours? What are you going to do? Most of you guys chose monitor I and O every shift. This is wild. So let's talk about this. I, I want to paint this picture in your head of what your patient looks like. You have a burn patient, right? So the minute you hear burn, the very first things that need to be going to your mind, you better be thinking of infection because remember your first uh, protection from infections, your skin, right? So I want you to be thinking of infection and I want you to be thinking about dehydration. People tend to forget because when the patient has a burn, they get all edematous and they forget that the patient is dehydrated because the patient's swollen. But guess what? When we're talking about dehydration, we're talking about lack of fluid wear within the vessels. All the fluid that was inside of the vessels seep out into the tissues and that's what causes that patient to be swollen, but there's no fluid. There's no blood in the vessels. Guess what? That causes dehydration. Organs are not going to be perfused because every single organ needs the vitamins, the oxygen, the minerals, the nourishment that's found in the blood. So with that being said, right? Um, we're worried about infection. We're worried about dehydration. We're worried about decreased perfusion. And by the way, whenever a patient's severely dehydrated or um, perfusion has gone down severely or the patient's at risk for shock, which a burn patient will be at risk for shock. One of the first things that starts to shut down is the kidneys. Just keep that in mind. So with this type of patient, here's our choices. Obtain and record weight. Absolutely. You better. But look what it says every other day. Are you crazy? This is a patient that's at risk for dehydration. You're going to be weighing that patient every single day, you're going to weigh them in the morning before they eat, same scale, same type of clothes. Why? Because um, the weight is the number one way that you can kind of um, tell about a patient's fluid status. It's not going to be INO. It's not going to be skin turgor, but you're going to do it every day, not every other day. So that's wrong, right? Let's move on to blue. Uh, monitoring INO every shift. Are you kidding me? Again, are you, you going to wait eight hours to do an INO on your patient? Because remember, normal uh, your output should be at least 30 mLs an hour, right? So you don't see 30 mLs the first hour. You don't see 30 mLs the second hour. You'll see 30 mLs the fourth hour. We don't care because we're going to wait till the end of the shift to do INOs on this patient. Absolutely not. You wait for that. Your patient could be going into shock. Their kidneys, their organs could be shutting down on you and you're going to mess around and lose your license. So we're not going to do that. Monitoring uh, uh, vital signs every four hours. Absolutely not. You better be monitoring that patient's vital signs every hour, if not every 15 minutes, just depending on um, how long your patient's been there. But every four hours, that's way too long. Now, the correct answer is monitoring the patient's mental status hourly. Let me tell you why that's the answer. Just like I told you, as a patient starts to go to shock, one of the first things that starts to shut down is their organ. Yep. One of the first things that you also see is a change in level of consciousness. And guys, this goes across the board. If you're taking exit exam, you're taking ATI, you're taking HESI, you're taking NCLEX. Whenever you see a patient that was previously awake, alert, oriented, times three, all of a sudden they're irritated. 
All of a sudden, they're confused. All of a sudden, they're agitated. What that's letting you know, we don't know exactly what's wrong with our patient, but we know something severely wrong. And very often, they're not getting oxygen to the brain. Their brain is not being perfused. That's why we're seeing a change in level of consciousness, right? So that's why this is the correct answer choice and the other ones are wrong. Let's keep going. I see you guys on the live. You guys are doing great. You're performing a neuro check on your patient post craniotomy three days ago. You should call the doctor as soon as possible if you notice what? If you notice the pupils are equal and reactive, if you notice pain with flexion of the neck, if you notice a mild uh, headache relieved by acetaminophen, or if you notice disorienta disori <clears throat> disorientation of current date. And I love this question. This is where your critical thinking comes in. <laughs> 31 of you guys chose disorientation of current date. Not, you know, disorientation look of current date. So they don't know exactly what day it is today. And 31 of, 31 of you guys chose that over pain with flexion of neck. By the way, that's the correct answer. I want you to think about, let's look at this clinical situation. This patient just had a craniotomy. So they had brain surgery three days ago. We know when it comes to surgery, we're always concerned about three things. No matter what type of surgery the patient has, we're always going to be concerned about infection. We're always going to be concerned about hemorrhage. We're always going to be concerned about that patient developing a DVT or that clot, you know, traveling, going to the lung, calling up, causing a pulmonary embolism. Always, right? Right. Now, if the patient just had surgery, like, you know, a couple hours ago, not so much infection because it takes a while for infection to develop, but the patient had this surgery three hours ago. So, you know, infection is still on the board as well as hemorrhage and DVT or pulmonary embolism. What is pain with flexion of the neck? A patient who just had brain surgery, now they're having pain with flexion of the neck. Do you guys know on the live, what do you suspect? Where, where am I going with this? What would you be concerned about? Thank you, help. Meningitis. You are concerned with meningitis. Look at how many of you guys chose disorientation of current date. That just lets us know, okay, the patient doesn't know today's the third or the 24th or the 27th. I don't have any brain issues. And sometimes I don't know what date it is, but guess what? That pain with flexion of the neck is going to be more concerning than disorientation of current date. It would be different if the patient didn't know, didn't know who they were, right? It would be different if the patient was suddenly agitated or suddenly irritable then, you know, that would be on my short list of what my priority is going to be. But between these two, guys, you can't try to be a robot or make everything black or white. You have to be able to use your critical thinking skills. The minute I saw that patient had brain surgery, now all of a sudden they're having pain with flexion of the neck. I'm going to be concerned about meningitis. That is a classic sign and symptom uh, of meningitis. Make sure you guys review that. Select all that applies. You're developing a discharge plan, plan for a patient status post-abdominal hysterectomy. Which instructions should be included? Select all the apply. So it's going to be more than one answer, guys. Your patient is being discharged and they had uh, an abdominal hysterectomy. What instructions are you going to give that patient? Here are your choices. Avoid heavy lifting. Sit as much as possible. Take tub baths instead of showers. Limit stair climbing to five times daily. Gradually increase walking as exercise, but avoid fatigue and avoid jogging and strenuous activities. What are you guys going to choose? Don't get mad at me on the live, guys. I'm trying to teach you how to think. It's not me. Okay, let's talk about this. So your patient just had hysterectomy. You're going to teach them to avoid heavy lifting. We don't want to put any pressure 
um, on that surgical area, right? We don't want to deal with dehiscence. We don't want to deal with evisceration. We don't want to deal with any of that. So we're going to teach them to avoid heavy lifting. We don't want them straining. Wonderful. We're also going to teach them to limit stair climbing to five times a day. We don't want them climbing stairs too much or too often. Nothing that is vigorous. Again, we don't want to put any pressure on that surgical site. Also, gradually increase walking as exercise, but make sure you don't allow yourself to get fatigued. We want that patient moving about because guess what? When that patient's not moving, blood slows down, blood does what? Clot. We don't want that patient to have a clot. We don't want them to have a pulmonary embolism. Patients not moving around, they can develop infection like pneumonia. We want to avoid all of that. So we want them to move. We want them to increase circulation. We want exercise, but not to the point of fatigue or exhaustion. Also, you're going to teach them to avoid jogging because that's going to be too strenuous for them. Avoid jogging and strenuous activity. Those are wonderful things that you're going to teach the patient. Here's what you're not going to tell them. You're not going to tell them to sit as much as possible. What do you know in nursing after a patient has surgery? Again, we are concerned about infection, DVT slash PE, and uh, bleeding. We want that patient moving around. We want to increase circulation. We want to increase perfusion. We do not want to increase the chances of the patient getting a clot. We're not going to tell them to take tub baths instead of showers because when you take tub baths, that increases your chances of what? Infection. And what else are we not? Okay, so just those two, we're not going to tell them. Everything else we're going to tell them. How are you guys doing on the live? I'm sorry, it's too late to join, but you guys can listen in. Your patient with Graves' disease has a problem with nutrition. What part, uh, what should be part of the care plan for this patient? So your patient has a grave disease and they have a problem with nutrition. What's going to be part of your care plan for them? Is it going to be to verbalize their needs to avoid snack between meals, discuss relationships between uh, blood and glucose levels, maintain normal weight or gain weight if they're below normal or verbalize the importance of meals, high in fat, low in protein. Very good. Patient maintains normal weight or they gain weight if it's below normal. Um, nutrition falls under physiological integrity. So that patient with Graves' disease, what do they have? Hyperthyroidism, right? Metabolism is through the roof. They're burning calories. They are burning calories faster than they can consume, right? Their physiological state has increased. So it's very important that you're gonna teach that patient you're going to uh, um, teach the patient about healthy foods, but um, also um, having a weight that is a healthy weight. If the patient has Graves' disease, they tend to be underweight because remember, their uh, metabolic rate is just really, really high. So we want them to get to a normal weight. And if they're below normal, we want them to gain some weight. We are not going to tell them to avoid snacks between meals, especially if this patient's got Graves' disease. They're going to have high calorie diets. So that's not true. Um, look at the other choice. Discuss the relationship between um, blood and glucose levels. That's not for your patient with Graves' disease. That would be, you know, for a patient that's a diabetic. And then the last choice, patient verbalized importance of meals high in fat, low in protein. We want the patient to have meals high in calories because they need those calories to survive, right? And protein as well. Protein is good for building muscle and protein is good for healing, wound healing. Placental abruption has caused fluid loss and decreased re renal perfusion in your patient. Which symptom would you assess for? Would you be looking for a bounding pulse? Would you be looking for lethargy? Would you be looking for decreased respirations or would you be looking for urinary output less than 30 milliliters per hour? Your patient had a placental abruption and it caused them to have fluid loss and decreased renal perfusion. decreased renal perfusion. So half of you guys chose the correct answer and half of you guys chose lethargy. So I want to go back to this. I want you guys to take a look. So your patient's got uh, placental abruption. They're losing blood. They're losing fluids. But here's your keyword in the question. It says decrease what? Renal. Renal as in kidneys. 
decreased renal perfusion. That word perfusion is just a fancy term for how well the organ is being fed, right? Blood feeds the organs because in blood is the oxygen, the vitamins, the minerals, the nutrients and nourishment that the organs need. So if blood flow is decreased, then perfusion is going to be decreased. So decreased renal perfusion, as I said in the beginning of this video, what is one of the first things to start to shut down? Kidney function. You're going to see a decrease in kidney function. Your patient should have at least, at a minimum, 30 mLs per hour. Select all that applies. Which instructions would you provide to the mother of a child that just had a plaster cast applied? Are you going to teach her to select all the apply? They just got a cast. Lift the cast using the fingertips. Dry the cast by placing the hair dryer on a hot setting. Place the extremity with the cast in the dependent position. Handle the cast with the palms instead of the fingers. Reposition the casted extremity every two to four hours. Direct a fan towards the cast to facilitate drying. Which instructions are you going to give to the mother of a child that just had a cast Okay, so let's talk about these answers. Uh, the correct thing you're going to teach the mother is to handle the cast with the palms, the palms and not the fingers. And the reason why you don't use your fingers, guys, you can cause indentation in the cast. Guess what? That indentation can cause pressure on the tissues and that pressure can eventually cause compartment syndrome. It can cause decreased circulation right? So we don't want to do that. You're going to teach her to use the palms and not the fingertips. You're going to teach her to reposition the casted extremity every two to four hours. Again, remember I taught you this. With decreased movement is decreased circulation. When blood is not circulating, guess what it does? It clots. We don't want our patient to develop a clot. So we're going to make sure that we're repositioning the patient. And the next thing you're going to teach them is to direct a fan towards the cast, and that's going to help drying. If you are going to teach them to about a hair dryer, if like, because it just depends on how the questions, the choices of answers that you have. But if you're going to use a hair dryer, number one, the hair dryer has to be on cool and not hot. That's number one. And number two, the problem with a hair dryer is that you can have uneven um, dryness. So one area can be dry and another not. But if the hair dryer is the correct answer, it's going to be cool. It's never going to be on hot. You're never going to use your finger uh, fingertips and you're never going to place the cast in the dependent position. I want you to think about this. If you place that extremity, I cast the extremity in a, in a dependent position, all of the blood, all of the fluid is pulling down in that extremity, right? Can a cast expand? No, it can no, it can't. So here you have this casted extremity. The extremity itself is getting larger and larger and larger because of all the swelling, but the cast is not expanding to accommodate all of the swelling. Now you got impeded circulation. Now that cast has turned into a tourniquet. So that's why you don't put it in a dependent position. We're trying to avoid swelling because the cast is not going to expand. Okay. How would you interpret these results? So the pH is 7.338, the PCO2 is 38, the PO2 is 86, and the HCO3 is 23. How would you interpret these results? Are they normal results? Is it metabolic alkalosis? Is it metabolic acidosis? Is it respiratory acidosis? Is it respiratory alkalosis? Or you know what, Professor D, at this point, I give up. I don't know. What do you guys say? Very good. Normal. Normal. So your key, whenever you're trying to figure out what's going on with your patient, the first thing you have to go to is this right here. You see what I'm circling? That pH, that pH is going to let you know if something's wrong or if it's normal. Because the name of the game 
is getting the pH to normal. Everything the lungs doing, lungs as in CO2, everything that's doing is to getting the pH normal. Everything the kidneys, that's your um, HCO3, everything your kidneys are doing are to get the pH to normal. The kidneys and the lungs both are working to get that pH between 7.35 and 7.45. So whenever you see that pH is between 7.35 to 7.45, we're good to go. Okay? So pH 7.35 to 7.45, we're looking at 7.38, it's normal. There's nothing wrong. But let's keep going. The PCO2, that's supposed to be between 35 and 45, it's 38, normal. The PO2, that's your partial pressure of oxygen. By the way, guys, I'm so tired of seeing you guys do this. Stop confusing the partial pressure of oxygen with your oxygen saturation rate. Your oxygen saturation rate is SAO2. The SAO2 you want between 95 and 100. The PO2, which is a partial pressure of oxygen, 80, actually your normal range is 75 to 100. So normal is about 80, but anything between 75 to 100 for your PO2, which is your partial pressure of oxygen, that's normal. So this is normal because it's 86. And then your bicarb, which is your uh, HCO3, that's your kidneys, right? Normal is about 22 to 26. This is 23. So across the board, we're dealing with normal. So these are normal results. Your patient's recovering from recent surgery. Which post-op complication should cause immediate concern? Tachycardia, cold skin, hypotension, fever, irritability, rapid respirations, slow pulse, warm skin, restlessness, or cold skin, drowsiness, and hypertension? Please don't give me a heart attack on this question, guys. I've done so much teaching. Let's see what you choose. Okay, so you guys were half and half. Um, 11 of you chose the tachycardia, cold skin, hypotension, which is the right answer. But 11 of you guys chose, chose fever, irritability, rapid respirations. All right, let's talk about that wrong answer. The fever, irritability, and rapid respirations. There is one word in this whole question that made you, that should have made you get rid of that choice. It says, where's my mouse right here? It says, look, it says your patient's recovering from what type of surgery? Recent. I could have just said your patient's recovering from surgery. I put that word recent in front of the word surgery to remind you this is something new. Remember when a patient has surgery, we're always going to be concerned about bleeding. We're always going to be concerned about them developing a clot or pulmonary embolism. We're always going to be concerned about infection. But remember, when it comes to infection, the timing is very important because if the surgery was very new, there hasn't been time for the patient to develop infection. That's why I put recent surgery. So you can rule the infection part out. It's too soon. That leaves us with the blood clot, pulmonary embolism, and uh, bleeding tachycardia, cold skin, hypotension, that patient's bleeding out. We're seeing the blood pressure go down. We're seeing the heart rate go up. That heart rate's trying to compensate for all the blood that's being lost because remember, what's being carried in the blood? Oxygen, remember, in the blood is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carries the oxygen. So if the patient's bleeding out, that means the oxygen's being decreased. So the lungs are trying to compensate so the respirations go up. That's why we're seeing the respirations go up. What about that cold skin? Well, when you touch a patient's skin, what you think makes them nice and warm? The blood flow. So that patient's starting to bleed out, their skin starts to become what? You're going to feel it being cold. That's a sign, this right here, that tachycardia, cold skin, hypotension, those are signs and symptoms of that patient bleeding out. I'm t guys, if you can train your mind to think this way, whenever you see a test question about a patient that came from surgery, automatically those three things you need to start considering. Hemorrhage, infection, and DVT slash PE. It's going to make your life a lot easier. Select all that applies. Your patient's been newly diagnosed with IDDM. That's your insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. 
which sign symptom of hypoglycemia will you teach? Select all that apply. So what are the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia? Hunger, sweating, weakness, nervousness, cool and clammy skin, increased urinary output. What do you guys say? Okay, guys, I see you on the live. I have my next NCLEX review tomorrow. How many of you guys registered? I look forward to seeing you. Everything except increase urinary output. So your patient has hypoglycemia. By the way, guys, hypoglycemia kill you a lot faster than hyperglycemia. But those signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, hunger. That blood sugar is low. Your body's going to try to survive no matter what. So you are going to be hungry because you're trying to get glucose because you don't have enough of it. Sweating. That patient's going to experience diaphoresis. Um, weakness, nervousness, cool and clammy skin. That's right. Cool and clammy. Give them candy, hot and dry patients too. What? Okay. All of these are signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, except for increased urinary output. Where, where do we see increased urinary output? We see that in hyperglycemia, where the patient's got way too much sugar in the blood and the body's trying to get rid of all the sugar. So we'll see excessive urination and they're trying to get rid of the sugar through the, uh, the they're trying to get rid of the glucose through the urination. So increased urinary output, we see that in hyperglycemia, but all these other symptoms we see in hypoglycemia. You're giving furosemide Lasix to a patient with hypertension. Which would be an adverse effect related to this medication? Would it be a chloride level of 98, a sodium level of 135, a potassium level of 3.1, or a BUN of 15? No Musa, sweating is hypoglycemia. Cool and clammy, they need candy. That word clammy, that's when their skin's all wet from the sweat. Anyway, back to Lasix, guys. Very good. Almost everyone got this correct. Potassium level. Even if you didn't realize that l -l Lasix makes you l -l lose potassium, when you're looking at these levels, number one, you should say to yourself, what kills my patient faster? And when it comes to fluid and electrolytes, potassium will kill you much faster than any of these other electrolytes. Here in the state of Florida, how do you think we kill our inmates? Potassium, right? It affects the heart directly. Anything outside of the normal range of 3.5 to 5 can cause the patient to have dysrhythmias. So 3.1 is hypokalemia, and that's a big problem. That's the correct answer. Your patient just had a thoracentesis. You'd be most concerned if that patient exhibited which finding? Would it be equal bilateral chest expansion? Would it be diminished breast sounds on the affected so uh, side? Would it be respiratory rate of 22 breaths per minute? Or would it be few wheezing and change from baseline? Very good. Diminished breast sounds on that affected side. What are we concerned about? We're concerned about that lung collapsing, right? That's what we're concerned about. Now, I see a couple of you fell for the few wheezing, but here's the key, because I know you saw wheezing. You're like, oh, wheezing, that's a problem, airway. But let's keep going. Wheezing unchanged from baseline. This is another concept that I kind of, I actually touch on, on a lot when I'm doing my NCLEX review. You cannot let them trick you that way. And when I say that way, what do I mean? When we're thinking about what's what's going to be a priority, what are we going to be concerned about most, right? If we see something bad, but that was the baseline, 
or that is part of the disease process, are we going to choose that as our priority versus something else that's going on with our patient? That was our key to let us know not to choose that answer. It said unchanged from baseline. So yeah, the patient has wheezing, but they had wheezing as their baseline. So that lets us know they had wheezing. We gave them the thoracentesis or the doctor, I should say, you know, we assisted. The patient got the thoracentesis and they're still wheezing as before. We're not going to be running to that patient as fast as we would a patient who has a change from before. Diminish. What does that mean? That means less. There's been a change. Diminish breath sounds on the affected side. You see the difference? You guys cannot get caught up in these type of situations. Let me tell you something. They will mess with you. They will give you a situation where they'll ask you which patient's a priority. And one of the situations they'll give you is a CH, CH, CHF patient that's having a uh, shortness of breath after ambulation or exercise, or they'll say the patient has emphysema or, or bronchitis, some type of COPD. That's part of their disease process after they exercise or ambulate, they're going to have shortness of breath. Do you see what I'm saying? So I'm not saying that's not the answer. That may be the answer depending on your other choices, but you have to say to yourself, if I have to choose this one person, that's a priority. One person that's most important for me to run to, you better go to the person whose status has declined and it was not expected to decline. This was not part of their disease process. This was not part of their baseline, okay? How often do you do these lives? Um, it's not scheduled, uh, baby dearest. I do it whenever I have a free minute and I never know when I'm gonna have a free minute. So I just do it as, as we go along. I'm sorry. All right, last question. You're assessing a patient who had a total gastrectomy two months ago. For which complication would you assess? Oh, I accidentally gave you guys this answer while I was teaching about something else. But anyway, what are your choices? Everyone should get this right. Is it vitamin B12 and folic acid levels? Is it blood urine nitrogen levels? Is it pupillary response to light or is it calcium levels? Before we started this Kahoot on the live, I was teaching you guys about something else and I, I talked about this. So everyone should get this correct. Your patient had a total gastrectomy. Which complication are you going to assess for? What are you going to be looking at? Very good. Or maybe that one person who got it wrong, I'm just going to assume you weren't on the live when I was doing that teaching, but everyone else got it correct. Vitamin B12 and folic acid levels, because that stomach has been removed. Therefore, there's no intrinsic factor. Remember, you need that intrinsic factor for the absorption of vitamin B12. You cannot survive without vitamin B12. So that patient is going to have to get an injection. And when I say injection, it's going to be I am an injection of vitamin B12 every single month in order to live. So B12 and folic acid. That's the correct answer. And remember that vitamin B12 is very important for um, the brain. Okay, CNS activity. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Please, in the comment section, let me know what you thought about this video. Don't forget, on my website, you can book a one-on-one -on -one consultation or tutoring session with me, Nexus Nursing Institute, or you can book a Next Generation NCLEX review, or you can go ahead and get yourself one or many audio lessons. Once again, that's nexusnursinginstitute.com. Thank you so much for watching. You guys will catch me on the next video.